Unknown Thought is made possible through the generosity of sponsors who care about people. IC Savings Bank, Ready Honda, and Corey's Clothiers. I'm back with Daniel Gelfand for another episode of Unknown Thought. Daniel is a producer, a journalist, and a fascinating man. <laughs> Daniel. With lots of unknown thoughts, obviously. That's great. That's what we want to get to. Daniel, you go to Kishinev. Yes. And you're doing volunteer HIV work in Russia. Yes. What happens to you there? Well, that's a big question. The first question I can tell you is that being in the um, former Soviet bloc was one of the most depressing experiences I've ever had in my life. Working with, and this is very... Um, I think this is fascinating because I went there as a volunteer. I went there with a CETA project that was trying to help build civil society. And one of the projects that was spearheaded here by a close friend of mine um, was a project to build a civil society in which community health care was available for people with HIV and AIDS and prevention. My job was to help uh, NGOs from small cities uh, although also from uh, St. Petersburg, all the way east from Siberia, all the way west to um, St. Petersburg, develop communication plans around HIV AIDS. They did not believe that it was possible that anybody like me could be coming without getting paid a lot of money. That was number one. They were completely suspicious of my intentions. Secondly, they could not understand how they could get people to do anything without paying money. Thirdly, they, uh, they themselves were in it because they were able to get uh, funding for their own projects and better salaries that they, than they could elsewhere because it was foreign funded, the CETA projects. In other words, the notion of goodwill did not exist. The other thing that I found shocking was that the... Um, the zeitgeist was, don't worry, tomorrow will be worse. <laughs> what year was this? This was 2003 or 2004. Wow. Now, after I finished doing that for 10 days, feeling somewhat um, beaten, my human spirit not believing at that moment in the indomitability of the human condition, I traipsed off with a very good friend of mine who has studied history all her life, to the four, three places where my grandparents were from. My maternal grandmother was from Kishinev, that was our first place. The second stop we went to was in Volin, where my, grand, um, where my father's parents were from, different towns. The notion of there being absolutely nothing left and our tour guides telling us that it was common practice in Moldova to pave the Jewish cemeteries over and put bus stations over top of them still brings me close to tears. To have experienced the, the desperation that I did of the soul with people who were supposed to be helping other people with HIV, and then to see what not only the Nazis had done, but after that the Soviets who had erased the Ukrainian history, and after that the Stalin, you know, the, the entire Russian history, to experience that for three weeks was the most crashing experience I've ever had in my life. I only recently opened up my photos from Eastern Europe because I have just been in Israel where I have one uh, cousin by marriage who is a survivor of the Holocaust who was married to a grandfather's cousin who was a member of the Palmach, etc. But he had come from one of those shtetl that I had gone to visit. And when I said I had gone, the nephew said I would love to see the pictures and I only then opened them up. And I'm talking six, seven years later, right? Wow. So it was devastating and left me quite lost because although I felt a desire to honor what, what had been in my family and what had been in our past, I was, I mean, there's nothing there. There's nothing left to honor. And, you know, peep, there was more many people who survived the Holocaust and people like my parents who were not children of survivors or survivors didn't want to talk about it, couldn't talk about it, and were taught not to talk about it. So I didn't even have really the tools to talk about it. And I must say that going to Israel just last month and being at Yad Vashem and being immersed in there for six hours um, helped me 
come back to understand and to see and to see the story because I had to see the stories. And now I think I have, I've, I've put beautiful photos up in my apartment, et cetera, et cetera. So what happened? Lots of things. Daniel, you're a man who feels deeply and your story about return to the uh, place of where your grandparents were and your deep passion and your sense of how deeply touched you were and how lost you felt tells me that you're someone whose emotions are, are deep. And I know that love is important to you and I know that you've been with Alan for a long time and if I can ask about same-sex marriage and the complications and the challenges and Judaism, what, what are you thinking about that? Um, I think what's relevant, most relevant for us, and I need your help with this, I want to wind back about 23 years when my brother, who's older than me, a successful plastic surgeon in Vancouver, was getting married. Of course, he was marrying a Jewish woman. And uh, I went to the, <laughs> I say, there's two things you have to help me with. What do you call the service that a groom does? I call it a roof roof. Uh, but an <laughs> off roof. An off roof. <laughs> <laughs> I call it the roof roof. Anyway, I went to the roof roof, and the parasha that week was about how man should not lie next to other men. Parashat Kedoshim. Yeah. yeah. And there I was on the bima, helping to bless his marriage and being ostracized from the place that, I was actually helping somebody else in. And I was furious. I almost felt that the rabbi had deliberately chosen that passage, which of course was not true because <laughs> it's by the calendar. Right. But I felt that, this, that I was angry and resentful that I would never feel um, welcomed this way in my faith. And I was angry and resentful that my brother or the rabbi hadn't foreseen this and actually spoken to me about it before for a sense of, hum uh, with some humility for the impact of what was going to happen. And um, I turned against Judaism then, or rather not against, I felt that there was no place for me. Hmm. So I think your original question was, how does it square with Judaism? Well, more than, I guess now I would say to you, so how, I know you well enough to know that you, you're connected. It doesn't matter religious or traditional or values-based, but you're connected. What happened? How did you reconnect? Was it a matter of finding the right place? Or was it a matter of recognizing that becoming part of a community that would never well, do that? Well, I think that. what's really been guiding for me and the most problematic thing for me, similar to the wandering around Eastern Europe and looking for something where there was nothing, um, was that I could never define myself as a... Jewish gay man or a gayish Jew man or a Canadian Jewish. I don't, so I don't know what I am in that regard. All I know is that as I've gotten older, I have to do what feels good. What I think was the most significant thing was my mother's dying and death. And the person who was most helpful to me was this same rabbi hmm. who actually was on the hmm. bima, who turned out I understood was one of only two rabbis in the Reform Synagogue in Canada when the rabbis, the Reform rabbis voted, was against the ordination of gays, which further at the time drove me away from being with my parents, being at the shul. Um, I guess basically that there's something to offer. How do I make meaning? For my mother's death, what I realized is there's something to offer here. How do I make meaning of it for me so I can still go? So, Daniel, so I, I haven't answered the question for you, nor have I answered okay. the question for myself yet. I think the point you're making, though, is, as I could see your answer happening, is that it's a cycle. It takes time. You can't always have the full answer. Sometimes the question needs to percolate, and then you can have an answer. I'm trying. That's Thank all you. I'm saying. Thank you for the courage to speak about it. Thank you for sharing your innermost feelings, and I very much appreciate you being here, Daniel. And thank you for asking. Second paragraph of the Shema. Three paragraphs we recite twice daily. Second paragraph is very clear. It's from Deuteronomy, and it tells us, if you listen to God's commandments, you'll have green fields, you'll have plenty of rain, your animals will be healthy, you'll eat well, everything will be great. If you don't listen to God's commandments, sky will be shut off, you'll have no rain, you'll be hungry, you'll be starving, it'll be a disaster. So if you want to enjoy the 
land on which you are going to live. In that case, this was pre-transition to ancient Israel. You better observe the commandments. So, let's understand this. If you are a good person and you do the commandments, there's rain, and if you do not, there's no rain. So there's the tap, and God is marking time and marking your behavior and shutting it on and off. Well, frankly, it's a nice idea, but for myself and for many people, it doesn't work. We don't conceive of God that way. I think as we get older, life is a little bit more too complicated for us to be so simplistic. But yet you'll say, the text says it. Well, let me tell you what the text is telling us. When you travel to Costa Rica and you go to some of these beautiful hotels and they're in a place called Guanacaste, go look at Guanacaste. You know what Guanacaste is? It's really hot. It's often dry, semi-arid, and it used to be a jungle. And what happened? Well, they cut down the jungle to plant sugar cane. And by cutting down the jungle to plant sugar cane, they changed the ecological and environmental balance. And the rain, the cycle of con condensation and precipitation was changed forever. And now what you have is dry and arid because of human intervention. So I'll be brief, and I will simply tell you that if you observe the commandments and you're a good and honest person, and you don't destroy that which belongs to the future generations or was built by the past, and you do not destroy your environment and dishonestly try to make money from other people's misfortune, and you're a good citizen of the planet, which means you're social, moral, and justly honest and integrity. If you are that person, you will not destroy the environment. And if you don't destroy the environment, the cycle of natural rain will always continue. So if you observe the commandments and you're a good person, you'll have rain. And if you don't, you won't. It's not rocket science. It's not even about God. It's good practice, not just God practice.